you never get to the sweet stuff in life if you don't keep going. And that's, again, what I was saying about wrestling angels, this idea of like those of us who who never give up on fighting that fight, who never give up on wrestling that angel, it's it's tricky, right? And like you don't know when it's going to come. You don't know when they're going to finally give you your blessing. But I can at least say from my perspective And I have heard many artists before me say this to me. And I thought, well, that's easy enough for you to say. (laughs) When's it going to happen for me? So I I can only offer my perspective as a sort of fairly recently elevated artist that it does come if you keep fighting the good fight. You know, if you keep wrestling your angel, blessings will come to you. They will. It's it's just how it's designed to happen. But you'll never get that blessing if you get out of line. You're never going to receive your thing if you if you shut it all down, give it all up. Hey everyone. How's it going? This is your host Yoshino. You're listening to episode number 223 of Artists Decoded. This is my conversation with artist and writer Sarah Zucker, a.k.a. The Sarah Show, if you follow her on Twitter or Instagram or any other social media platforms. But Sarah was introduced to me by our mutual friend Jennifer Aronovich, who was previously known as Jennifer Sodini. And hey, Jen. We uh, give you a shout out in the episode, so I hope you like that. But Sarah has been getting a lot of attention for her success in the NFT world. She minted her first NFT in early 2019, which we talk about. But she's also known in the space as being an OG, even though, uh, <laughs> even even though 2019 wasn't really that long ago. But she talks about that a bit, but she's also had over 6.7 billion views on the platform Giphy. And, you know, we had a really metaphysical oriented and psychedelic conversation here. We talked a bit about Greek mythology, and we also talked about the story of Cassandra and Apollo. She has a project called the Cassandra Complex, which was released as an NFT not too long ago. We also talk about a paradox that exists in all of us and this conundrum that we face uh, in terms of stating certain things, but you'll have to wait to find out what that is about. But she talked about her childhood a bit as well in the beginning of the episode and how those experiences have shaped her into the woman that she is today. We talk about issues of identity as well, which I felt was very deep and we went into that conversation with an open mind and an open heart and I just really appreciated this sort of dialogue but I'm really thrilled to be able to share this conversation with you all it was great to have a conversation with Sarah and I really respect her as an artist so without further ado here's my conversation with Sarah Zucker hope you enjoy it Thanks, you know, thanks for taking the time to do this. And I'm glad that our mutual friend, Jen, uh, put us in touch. And um, she's always really good about that and uh, so gracious with connecting friends, you know. Indeed, she is. Yeah. Shout out to Jen. Shout out to Jen. (laughs) Yeah. Cool. (laughs) Well, okay. So I'm going to start off with the most serious question that I have. Are you ready for this? Lay it on me. What's it like being a Jeopardy champion? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that is, uh, that's very hard hitting journalism on your part. Um, (laughs) Yeah. You know, what is it like? Well, the weirdest part about it, and I, I wonder sometimes if this is something like maybe child stars can relate to, like the weirdest thing about it is how recording an episode of Jeopardy, it's, it's like in real time, right? So it's 22 minutes of your life. Like it's, it's not, it's not that long. And yet, right. The outcome of it can kind of like, you know, that's a badge I will wear for the rest of my life of like, yes, she won Jeopardy. How about that? You know, like 
that saying right uh, seven years ago for 22 minutes i was able to like pool my neurons <laughs> enough to like you know answer yeah. har- rapid fire questions about bears and shakespeare and bluegrass <laughs> music you know yeah um, all, all, all in one all in one sentence bears, yeah bears, yeah bluegrass. exactly and yeah. and it's that you know i don't know what what is cool about it is that like it's this it's this thing it's this like signifier that means something to like most people at least in the united states you know what i mean like jeopardy is a cultural institution its name the concept of it it means something and um and that's what i like about it you know it's it's also a little i'm i'm a fairly humble person like i i always try to like (laughs) i don't you know I, i guess what i'm trying to say is it's like i don't feel the need to like brag about it i at a certain point took it out of my social bios and stuff. Cause I was sort of like, okay, that happened like, you know, over, over uh, half a decade ago. And like, <laughs> yeah. I do other cool stuff. And, yeah. and maybe for me, I'm, I'm lucky in that regard that like, I don't need to lead with it. Um, but it is a really, really easy, like icebreaker with almost any person I meet. Um, it's not an icebreaker I can bring up. Uh, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> yeah, it's kind yeah. of hard to be like, "Well, hello there." Like <laughs> I am a Jeopardy champion, but my, someone's my... like, "I'm sorry, what's your name?" Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. It's like okay, maybe you know, maybe get maybe take me to dinner first before you slap me with that. Um, but uh, <laughs> but yeah, but my wife is really good about like she knows that it's a it's a really kind thing she can do for me if I'm like having a moment of social awkwardness or anxiety she knows if she tells someone i'm talking to like hey do you realize sarah's a jeopardy champion it's like such an easy i mean as we are right now it's such an easy like thing that any human being at least if they're you know in the united states or or, you know fairly acquainted with our culture they're like oh my god that's you know it's not every day i meet someone that that's true of like tell me about it and so that I would say is honestly the biggest like net positive of it in my life is it's always going to be this little nugget I have in my bag that I can yeah. be like, these people might not, they might be looking at me like I'm an alien. That has happened to me <laughs> in most conversations <laughs> throughout my life. So it's, it's like really nice. It's why I'm like, I'm also like getting into baseball right now. Like I was into baseball when I was a kid and I've decided recently I'm going to like get into the Dodgers and like learn the team and learn the stats. Cause I like collected baseball cards as a kid. I like, I, you know, I did too. Yeah. Baseball's yeah. like my sport <laughs> for whatever reason. And I, mm-hmm. and it's like, I guess my point is the reason I've like, I'm making this like concerted effort to get into baseball is because at the end of the day, I am someone who needs a certain degree of like being able to just communicate with my fellow human and like Mm. feel not completely alienated all the time. Um, Mm. Because so much of what I, what my work, my life's work has been about has been leaning into the fact that I've always felt like an alien and leaning into it and recognizing as you get older and stronger, like that you're, you're, spirit gets stronger that you go I can withstand being alienated and I can withstand everyone looking at me sideways and going what the hell is she up to because I I must I have a unique gift to like bring into this world that is important to me you know I won't (laughs) I don't know how important it is to the world but it's important to me and so in order to be like a counterbalance to that I've realized how how nice it is to have something like, oh, I'm going to get into baseball so that like any any man, woman, child, non-binary entity I I encounter in this city of mine, maybe this is a conversation I could have with them because they're not going to understand most of what I'm what I do, what I'm interested in, what I'm about. So I've just am like taking up this very sort of. <laughs> populist and I don't want to say lowbrow exactly but like non-intellectual interest um of baseball like it's charming and it's 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 um it's a simple and it's a pure pleasure the love of something like baseball so yeah so yeah it's like jeopardy is weirdly like that you know what I mean it's 
it's well, it's I something can... that's super relatable. I mean, the yeah three main game shows I can think about off the top of my head is The Price Is Right, yeah, Wheel of Fortune, and Jeopardy. In terms of American culture, right? for sure, and Jeopardy's the one where people if you say it they're like oh you smart (laughs) and you're like yes I I am smart um or at least I'm I'm good at remembering things which is very very different from being smart Mm. but I'll take it do you have a really good memory yeah I do and it's Mm. I'd say it's like a huge part of my art my writing like how I express myself is I have like what they call like a semi-photographic memory or semi-eidetic memory. Um, You know, full, a complete photographic memory is typically associated with the autism spectrum disorder, Mm. um, Mm -hmm. which is a question mark for me of like, lately I've been wondering sometimes of like, maybe I'm on that spectrum. Uh, Women are often not diagnosed. So Mm. I don't know. That's a, that's just a question mark I put out into the universe. <laughs> does, does it does that does that bother you to think about that, or do you embrace that more? Oh no! It yeah, it doesn't bother me at all. In fact, it's I guess why I even question it is because there's a certain degree of like when people get diagnoses like that, especially as adults, it's and not that I've had this experience personally, but from what I've mm-hmm. heard people say about it, and again, women are rarely diagnosed with it in childhood because we're socialized to uh, learn how to be socially affable uh, just because we're female. I wonder Um, how much, I wonder how much that has to do with these sort of implicit, not even implicit, but these systemic patriarchal values as well. I mean, it's a hundred percent has to do with that. And that's, it's so funny, all these little myriad ways where your flesh suit (laughs) ends up completely like, affecting your life in ways like that exactly like not getting not ever not anyone ever even like going well she's functional she's fine and I guess that's why I it's that it's not an upsetting question I don't think I think there's nothing you know it's it's just a a neurological difference right Mm -hmm. and like I'm saying this all and the reality is I probably am not but it's just to say there are certain there are certain aspects of it that I just find I I just find I go well I am that like I have um I have a very heightened uh experience of of senses like I have uh sen- sensory mm. sensi- uh, sensitivity that sounds reduc- uh, repetitive but mm. uh that thing of sort of like I it like causes like a traffic jam in my brain if I'm over overstimulated by exterior oh. senses and I like shut down uh And I mean, you know, that's just also a trait of being a sensitive person. So Mm. I don't know. But I've gone off on a tangent here. But it's it's all to say that uh, I don't know what it's all to say. You know, (laughs) (laughs) I I I I let this train get off the track and I'm just going to go with it. (laughs) I love I love tangential sort of conversations because it can always become circular, you know. But um, would you consider yourself a highly sensitive person? Oh yes, uh, that I that I definitely am. At least in my own my own uh, armchair psychologist self diagnosis. Yeah, yeah, I I definitely I there's there was a friend of mine a couple years ago mentioned that ter- I'd never heard that term before, and it was it was maybe three or four years ago, and she was like, oh, have you ever heard of what this is? She was like, I think it's you. Like I think you're kind of like the textbook that. And there's like, you know, there's a book and there's a self test you can do. And I think I got like 95 percent of it was like, yes, you are this thing. Um, And that's what I mean by when I mused on on that and just how sort of when I hear people's experience being on the autism spectrum disorder. And there's so much I relate to the one piece that's not true of me that I think is probably the crucial thing is I have like very heightened social awareness. I have like more social awareness than I wish I had. And it uh, manifests as, as anxiety, you know, I, and I, I'm always very concerned with not exactly with what other people think of me because God knows I would not have chosen the life path I've chosen uh, if I really were that concerned about that. But I am just very aware of all of the like little minutia and little like micro feelings people have all the time and I'm always very concerned with like Mm. I I wish to cause no harm right I wish to not hurt other people's feelings and 
I've sort of always been someone who in my entire life, people put a lot of stock in what I think of them. It's always been that way. And I had a teacher actually when I was uh, in the sixth grade, this interesting thing happened to me. I've been thinking about this story a lot recently. Mm where it was a gifted education class. And so, you know, very of that era, like like the show Malcolm in the Middle basically depicted it exactly what this sort of era of gifted education was. But I loved this teacher. She just was like so good with us. And she had that thing that I think crucial is crucial to good teachers, which is that they never talk down to you. Like just because you're young doesn't mean you're an idiot. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah. And... And I, that's what I always really liked about her. Her name was Miss Noble, is Miss Noble, and um, which is a great name. <laughs> that a, is a great you name. You know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> like, she, it suited her. And so this this thing happened where it started to be this year. In sixth grade, I mean, look, I was 12. I That was the year where I started calling myself Jethro and, mm. like, presenting as this, like, skater boy. Mm. I, it was a gender thing happening. I don't know. And I'm, I still sort of work through it. Um but yeah, it was a year where it wasn't exactly like I showed up to school and was like, I'm a boy now. You know, it wasn't that exactly. I was just I was just like letting a part of myself express itself. Right. And it, and that's a part that's still with me. In fact, my wife off like we talk about Jethro. Sometimes I'm Jethro still like that part of me still exists. This mm. like this little Bart Simpson that's in me. And um, <laughs> it's all to reference. say I was. Yeah, I was really like. That was just a year where I was. I just, it's not that I was badly behaved. I just had a lot of energy and I was the hormones and good God, you know, I was just a little wild. And, and I was comfortable in this class because I liked this teacher and she liked me. We had an understanding, but I am a, a vivacious person and I have a voice that can be heard from about a hundred miles away. Like, and so if I get worked up or excited or, you know, that I, I can understand how a teacher, an adult, will be like, you need to calm down and be <laughs> quiet. And so we got into this pattern of like, because if I got riled up, the rest of the class got riled up. And so it became this pattern and almost running joke of her being like, Sarah, go sit in the corner. Like anytime the class got a little too loud, she was like, Sarah, go sit in the corner. And I'd always make a show about being like, oh, no, I'm in trouble, you know. But like I always kind of knew I deserved it. So it was always mm -hmm. like fine. And I wasn't like in trouble, trouble. It's different when a teacher yells at you in anger than when they're just like, I have the solution. Sarah needs to go sit in the corner. OK, <laughs> everything's returned to normal. And so then there was this one day where I was drawing. I don't know what I was working on, but I was when I draw, I can get very immersed. Um, and so I was like minding my own business. I was drawing, working on something. And a bunch of my classmates were playing Boggle <laughs> in the corner of the room. We loved playing Boggle. I still <laughs> love playing Boggle. Mm -hmm. So they were all playing Boggle. And they were getting kind of loud, kind of rowdy. And I was like ignoring them. I was like busy. I was like, I am making a vision happen. I'm in my own. <laughs> I'm in my happy place. Like I am not paying attention to this game of boggle. I don't care. And then out of nowhere, my teacher goes, Sarah, go sit in the corner. And hmm. the part of me that is like, that cares about justice, like I, I a little bit want justice maybe more than the average person it's like I really don't like injustice like it was that thing of like well there's an injustice here I was being silent I was minding my own business it upset me and I think I cry I think I was like I cry it was like it ups it hurt my feelings that I was mm. like wait I'm not actually a bad kid and why am I being punished right now I was not part of this at all and I think my teacher you know she could sense I was upset and she was like listen, you're not in trouble. Just stay after class. I want to talk to you about something. And so I did, you know, and after all the kids left and I was like, it, it, I just felt like shit. You know what I mean? Like it just, mm -hmm. I hated getting in real trouble at school, you know? And she sat with me after this class and she was like, she was like, you know, I didn't make you go. Sit. You're right. You weren't doing anything wrong. I know you were being perfectly well behaved. I didn't make you go sit in the corner because you were being bad. She said, but you weren't paying attention to what was going on. You didn't notice that all those kids playing boggle were coming up with like dirty words and like bad things. And they were trying to get you to laugh. 
They were Mm. doing it for you. They were putting on a show for you. And she said, and the more you didn't pay attention to them and the more distracted you were by what you were doing, the worse they were getting and the more out of hand they were getting and they were being too loud. Like it was it was disruptive. She was like, so I knew the best way to make it all stop was punish you. And 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 I was right. And they all stopped. And I was like, well, that's you know, that sucks. That's not fair. And she said, of course, it's not fair. She's like, but you need to remember this, this lesson, this moment, she said, because you have this effect on people. People want to get your attention. They want your approval. And Hmm. and you're going to have situations like this for the rest of your life where things are going to affect you even if you weren't participating and even if you weren't yeah. like you need to, and so you just, it, you, you are someone who's going to have to have a heightened awareness about the effect you have on people. And look, I mean, she taught me a lot about myself that day. I think it also maybe doesn't, d- didn't help that I already have a tendency towards anxiety. It's like, Jesus Christ, I already have my eye on everything. Now yeah. I have to add this to the mix that like people care so much what I think. Um, but it is. It's one of those things. It's, it's a it's a heavy ways the head kind of situation, right? Yeah. Of like, I recognize that that also the flip side of that is that with that with that incredible responsibility also comes incredible power. And I guess why I even told that whole story, which I truly don't think I've like ever. It's, I've only recently been reflecting on. It. I don't know that I've ever publicly told anyone about that, but yeah, I guess I think about it because a lot's been coming up for me lately. Uh, yeah. in the spaces I move in that really mirrors that. And that's interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and just, and just that, right. That I, I recognize that, that right. It's, it's an inherent power that I'm able to tap into and that it's very important to me that I wield that power thoughtfully always mm. and ethically always. Um, yeah. Well, and also I think, I mean, I don't, I don't know, you know, obviously <clears throat> from your experience, but just from an outside perspective and the research that I did, it seems that you and your work has been getting a lot, a lot more popularized after you started minting NFTs, mm. right? And then so mm-hmm. that sort of presence that you already possess, like within your nature, emanates out to a more mass audience of people to where, and I mean, I think on another podcast you were talking about some of the negative backlash that you would get from Mm -hmm. people that you knew personally from minting NFTs when there was that whole ecological, you know, discussion about, um, I I think that's what it was about, right? Yeah. About, Mm -hmm. um, the ecological ramifications of, um, utilizing Ethereum. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. And, you know, which I'll point out a lot of those discussions are, hinge on a lot of misinformation not that there aren't genuine concerns there's genuine concerns about everything we do that uses electricity and and what it means um but yeah it's you're right i mean it's i am someone who's been a primarily digital or screen-based artist for the better part of a decade if not longer and um you know and always i won't say always but for for a while there certainly had my own nice little following, I guess, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. you know, in the social media era, which I do believe we're uh, beginning <laughs> those, to transition out of. Days. Yeah, like, tum- <laughs> right, I big tum- my Tumblr heydays, and then even sort of transitioning to Instagram being sort of more central to how I uh, put my work out. And yeah, I often think about that, how so much about uh, the success I've found releasing my work as NFT editions uh, it's it's that thing, right? Of like, I like to say we meet chaos halfway, you know. And, and what I mean by that is like, hmm. half of it is out of our hands, and and there's luck, and just like Jeopardy, right? Like you don't know what questions you're gonna get. You don't know if it's gonna be, if it's gonna be a subject matter you know anything about or not. That's the part of it that's just, you know, the the grand web of the universe delivering you a hand that suits you or sometimes one that doesn't suit you so well and for me Mm. with nfts a lot of it is about being the right person at the right time at the right place right but so much about being the right person is 
everything I did leading up to it and everything I built leading up yeah. to it and the experiences I had and just that I by the time I started minting NFTs that already I'd been doing what I'd been doing long enough to have a clear voice mm -hmm. and uh, you know I talk about this at, I've talked about this many times about you know the sort of Ira Glass concept of like you have to be bad at what you do before you're good at what you do and that's true of everyone people love to throw the, ter the word genius around or you know master or anything like that and it's like well you don't get to be that unless you stick through the part where you're bad at it <laughs> you know like you never get there if you don't stick through yeah i mean i th i have like i mean i don't know if this isn't quite my theory but just from a observational standpoint i think that a lot of that has to do with being in this capitalistic society where mm. a lot of people like you can get certain rewards pretty quickly right you can mm -hmm. go on amazon mm -hmm. you can purchase something that's going to make you feel good immediately mm -hmm. there's this sort of instant gratification that's built within the models of technology right and mm -hmm. so when that instant gratification isn't constantly um we're not constantly getting that then i think there's this cognitive dissonance that happens with people to where they think oh like nfts are really popping off i mm -hmm. want to become an artist mm -hmm. it's just like what you weren't a fucking artist before like yeah you know what i mean like I, oh i get i get i get <laughs> that I, mean? I get the people who reach yeah. out to me and go oh i see nfts are like amazing should i start making art and i'm like or like should i start releasing nfts like i don't make art but but i can start and it's that thing where you know they don't I always try to before I before I like <laughs> blast a flamethrower yeah, at yeah, someone. No, I, I, I get you. I yeah. like I take Here's a moment. Disclaimer. I breathe. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I take a moment. I breathe because you want because you what I want to say is like, do you realize how disrespectful it is to say that to an artist? Like it's really you're saying that what you think that what I do is not only a whim. You think it's just something someone can just pick up and instantly be good and successful at it. And. My point is that I recognize when someone says something like that, that's not what they're meaning to say. That's not the intention of what they're saying to you. But subtext is important. What someone means subconsciously, I think, is actually more important than what they're saying verbally. Oh, oh, and that's yeah. what they're saying is like, oh, well, the art, art is just stupid is basically what they're saying. Art is the art is negligible. I want to make money is what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, there is absolutely... I've been minting my work as NFTs since early 2019. And, and the first two years of that was like very different. I always say we were like Care Bears holding hands and running on our fluffy little clouds together. Aww. You know, it was very <laughs> it was a small knit community. Yeah. There were only a, a handful of like big collectors. You kind of could know everyone in the space at that time. And then this year uh, with the Beeple sale and it really was a synthesis of a number of events kind of all happening around the same time in like January, February, yeah. it blew up. I mean, NFTs on every major news outlet, like everyone knows, my parents know about NFTs because it's on the nightly news, you know, mm. and um, right. It changed it. It became something it, it transmuted into something different. And I, I have, of course, been very fortunate that, I, like I said, I. I was prepared for it, even if I didn't realize I was, that it was like yeah. everything I'd been doing up until that point suddenly catalyzed in this new way. But my my point with that, I guess, is to say, because mm -hmm. I have spoken, I've spoken to journalists, I've spoken to people who weren't aware of my work before, and and they kind of will come with this unconscious bias of like, wow, what's it like to just suddenly blow up? What's it like to just suddenly out of no, no one's ever heard of you before? So what's it like to just suddenly be this high profile artist in making work in the in NFTs, the hot new trend everyone's talking about? And my response is always, well, I'm like a 10 year overnight success. You know what I mean? You're, you're talking to me like I just started making art yesterday and stumbled into this. And for me... I say tenure because, again, my current practice, the current type of work I do is at this point about a 10-year period of work. Prior to that, I was primarily a photographer uh, in terms of my visual art practice. Um, but I've also been an artist like my entire life, you know. And 
I've been musing on this a lot recently because I this concept sort of came to me and I'll phrase it this way and I'll preface it by saying I'm not a religious person. If I belong to any of the religions, I'm, I'm Jewish. I mean, uh, and, and that's important to me, but I'm not a, I'm not dogmatic uh, by any means. I preface that only to say I often reference things from the Bible and because I like it as a story um, and I, I mm. recognize I've had in the past people sort of misconstrue that as thinking that I'm uh, religiously devout, which I am not. Um, mm. But it's all to say I really – one of my favorite figures is is the figure of Jacob who is a trickster, who is a, who's a, a personification of cleverness uh, same as Prometheus in Greek myth. Um, I'm all, I'm often drawn to these characters in myth who who personify cleverness because I feel that that is the type of that is the archetype that I feel most um, aligned with. The idea of of a hero who can enact their will through their cleverness. And I've hmm. lately been thinking a lot about the story of Jacob wrestling the angel and and demanding a blessing and what it is to re- the idea of as a mortal to wrestle an angel to wrestle the divine and say i demand i demand you bl- you bless me i demand it you know and i've been musing i've been chewing on this a lot lately because i was thinking about how the majority of people you know they they mm-hmm. stop wrestling their angels before they receive their blessing because mm. there's no more exhausting task for a, a mere mortal, right? Like most people at a certain point, they give it up because the, because the wrestling takes so much out of them that they recognize I can have a, I can have an adequate life without the, without that blessing. And, and I, and I would rather be comfortable than keep wrestling my angel. Yeah. And it's really for interesting me, that you say that. Yeah. Yeah, I just feel like for me and for for a number of the other folks that, you know, as this movement has sort of come to a greater awareness among people, uh, and and I've seen a number of artists I've known a long time now, again, be getting this recognition on a grander scale. And and I would say their their experience might be analogous to mine. I feel like I came into this world wrestling my angels. Even as a child, I was concerned with questions about existence and even as a child I felt that this need this in this just insatiable need to question and express myself and Mm -hmm. it occurs to me that it's like I never gave up wrestling my angel for years I mean I barely keeping a roof over my head and yet because I never have known anything else it just never was a question for me or maybe it was a, you know, it's not to say I didn't question it and question why am I doing this? Why am I, why do I keep fighting so hard for this? And then there's just that little voice in the back of your head that's like, because there is no other option, truly. There really is no other option to just give this up because I don't know what life would look like for me if I said, you know what, never mind. I guess I'm not an artist. I guess I'm going to go sell cars or something like mm. I just didn't have that option. Did you ever have any very confronting um, situations with yourself to where you really questioned if you would make it as an artist? Oh, I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> the The long, dark night of the soul is... I have experienced it many times and I continue to experience it and I don't know if it'll ever go away. And I think yeah. that... I think that that I don't want to call it doubt. I think dread is the right word. Existential dread. <laughs> Existential um, dread. I love that. I, I love that. I you really think that. actually for me, again, art and expressing myself. And I'm not only a visual artist. I'm a writer as well. That's a side of me that yeah. tends to not get as much uh, notice these days. But for a long time, that was sort of my primary um my primary practice. Um, well, yeah. And, and you have a, your BA in uh, theater and creative writing, right? Yeah. And yeah, MFA and in dramatic writing. Yes, exactly. So academically, I never, I never trained in visual art. I just always have been a visual artist. I've always made art um, for many years. It was just how I self-soothed. And I guess mm. that's, that's what I'm getting at here is 
that this existential dread <laughs> that I possess that is has been palpable in me since my earliest days like truly I think my aunt used to call me the Russian poetess when I was a child I had this way I liked to lay upside down on the staircase because I liked how my hair would would cascade down the stairs and then I would and then I would wail (laughs) and then I would moan about like the you know the, the injustices of the world right and just the like the pain the burden of existence <laughs> like I was kind I of a that. I was a funny kid I'm still a funny person but that's the flip side right the tears of the clown of like I cannot help I do I have a deep well of if not sadness maybe fear is the right word <laughs> I have a deep mm. well of like uh of this sense of like not being held maybe by the universe and art is the way I like build myself a cradle Hmm. and go shh shh, little baby you're okay like you're okay hold yourself Mm -hmm. and and I guess it's that that it's like yeah it's all to say that have I questioned if it would ever work out probably probably every day of my life and I still do I, I I think yeah that's something I mean you know, we're talking about like comfortability and people running towards comfortability on a mass scale. And, Mm -hmm. um, maybe part of that has to do with people not listening to their intuition, you know, Mm. something that, um, and masking it with different things. I mean, you can think about makeup, right. And Mm -hmm. masking who you are externally because of some idea of, what beauty looks like. Right. And Mm. just as like an example. Right. But Mm -hmm. I think that being able to embrace the paradox, this sort of like paradoxical life that we live in and that things are circular and, you know, and not everything has like an answer. There's some sort of beauty in that and also embracing uh, your limitations. You know, I, Mm. I heard you talking about in an interview how you have bad eyesight. (laughs) Yeah. And for a long time, that would give you a lot of grief, right? Mm -hmm. Because you you can't you you can't see like maybe someone else, right, or Mm -hmm. or whatever, right? And another one of my friends, for instance, he's colorblind, Mm. and a lot of his work is all black and white. Mm -hmm. And but it's kind of to his benefit as well because he really focuses on design and the way that things are cut and shaped and everything like that, right? So Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think like. I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel the older that I get, the more that, and it's not a perfect thing, right? I Mm -hmm. I, want to say like the more comfortable that I get within myself, but the more, with that being said, the more that I'm also, I have more demons because the more that I sort of embrace these sort of things that were hard, right? The more that I bring them out, the more that I feel them. And so it's kind of this paradoxical way of thinking, but I think the older that you get, the more that you're able to re- recognize and understand it depending on your level of consciousness. Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. I'm, I'm chewing on what you're saying here. I mean, what it brings to mind for me is, and I've definitely been feeling this as well, it's, it's really as simple as like the more you love, the more you suffer. Like the, <laughs> to be very yeah. Ru- Russian about it for a moment, but like, the more mm. you love, the more you suffer. And what I mean by that is as as you as you get older, yes, you have more in your life that you care about. You have people that you care about, people you want to take care of, uh, mm. things you want to take care of. You build, you you know, most of us, not everyone. I think some people um yeah. get it get addicted to novelty. And so they will they don't realize that they burn everything down before they start the second act because the second act is hard. You know, <laughs> getting back to the idea of like wrestling angels, it's really difficult. So, as a writer, I sure know the second act is a real pain in the ass. You know, first act's easy, third act's easy, easy to come up with a beginning, easy to come up with an ending. Very, very difficult to write mm-hmm. a compelling middle and to continue. You know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a screenwriter primarily like anyone who's familiar with screenplays or with movies, the middle is the longest part, Mm -hmm. you know, the, the the beginning's about 15, 20 minutes, the end's about 10 to 15 minutes, the middle's most of the movie. And, uh, I bring this all up because for a long time, one of the ways I, you know, again, kept a roof over my head is that I was a script reader in Hollywood. 
Um, so I've read I've read a lot of screenplays, and that's nine times out of ten. That's the problem. Is uh, if you have problems in your second act, it means you had problems in your first act. And I think a lot of people in life. Not a lot of people, but it's cer- a certain trait I've noticed in in people and often in artists uh, because it goes hand in hand with that sort of that part of you that wants to fly free and soar. Hmm. You recognize as you take on commitments and as you settle a little bit into something, you get that itch of like everything's getting too real. Everything's getting too. This is no fun anymore. Now I have all these responsibilities. So I think a lot of people fall into the trap of, well, what if I just change everything then? What if I just move to a different city? What if I just move? You know, it's, it's often takes the form of that. What if I just move somewhere and then start all over again? Because it's exciting to start all over again. And what they sacrifice is, yes, the middle is fucking hard. The second act is a real bitch because it's going to reveal to you what wasn't set up right at the beginning and you're going to have to deal with it and and demon, demons are going to pop up and challenge you and it's going to suck. But you never get to the sweet spot. You never get to the sweet stuff in life if you don't keep going. And that's, again, what I was saying about wrestling angels, this idea of like, those of us who who never give up on fighting that fight, who never give up on wrestling that angel, it's it's tricky, right? And like you don't know when it's going to come. You don't know when they're going to finally give you your blessing. But I can at least say from my perspective, and I have heard many artists before me say this to me, and I thought, well, that's easy enough for you to say. <laughs> When's it going to happen for me? So I, I can only offer my perspective as a sort of fairly recently – elevated artist that it does come if you keep fighting the good fight you know if you keep wrestling your angel blessings will come to you they will it's it's just how it's designed to happen but you'll never get that blessing if you get out of line you're never going to receive your thing if you if you shut it all down give it all up having said all that I also think, Mm -hmm. (laughs) again, I like what my friend Colin Frangicetto always says. I reserve reserve the right to contradict myself. So allow me to contradict everything I just said here. Yeah, you're not a politician. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I'm I'm a slippery interdimensional Cheshire cat. So here, allow me me to say exactly the opposite of what I just said. I also think that I think that all human beings are built to be creative. I think it's a I think it's a biological function, just like eating or shitting. You're meant to express yourself. You're meant to be creative, 100%. I do not think that all human beings are are the archetype of artist. I think that that's a very specific type of person and mm-hmm. a very specific role to play in society. And I think it's something where, and I don't say that to scare people, Uh, And I don't say it to be a gatekeeper by any stretch of the imagination. Why I say that is I think some people mistake the fact that they find creativity pleasurable. They mistake that for the calling to be an artist. And then they suffer and they suffer and they suffer as it's hard to be an artist professionally. And I think there is absolutely nothing wrong. And in fact, I applaud people when they recognize at a certain point you know what? I think I'd actually be happy being a realtor or being a chef or being, you know, being something else. Maybe, you know, as they say, the insanity is is doing the same thing over and over again and respect and expecting a different result. Right. And I'm always sort of trying to put that out there for people of just because you went to school for art doesn't mean you have to now be an artist. Just because you told everyone you're an artist doesn't mean you have to continue to be an artist. And I mean that artist with a capital A with a with a in a in a professionalized sense. And just because you decide to no longer pursue art professionally does not mean you need to stop being creative. And in fact, I think people often find when they take that pressure off themselves, it 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 refills the well of creativity that they had tapped out. Mm. Um. And I think that maybe the things I was saying about wrestling with angels, 
if you heard that and you had that ping inside you, that that feeling in the in the deepest pit of your stomach where your fire lives, if it like that flame sparked up for a second because you went, that's it. I, I know I know that feeling. I know I know what she's talking about. Well, can, you may be an artist. <laughs> like it may, you may be one of the people who, as difficult as it is, you just can't mm. be anything else. And all I can say to you is, find friends who understand and and keep wrestling yeah. your angel. You know, because it's your path. And um, but if if you heard that and kind of went, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know. That sucks. <laughs> that sounds like it sucks. Go, go be a chef. Go be something else. like we need there there are so many such a cornucopia of identities you can have in one lifetime it's also that like artist is not a prison it's not it is if you make it it's not like i i well it's that's you know and it's what you were saying earlier about it's like the byproduct of capitalism it's the cult of productivity the cult of like achievement if you do not achieve you have no worth that's bullshit it's just bullshit it's just this lie we tell ourselves to make sure our society doesn't fall apart yeah Uh, it's puritan work ethic right and like the puritans are not my faves like i'm probably descended from some of them and i'll be the first to tell you i think they had it wrong i don't care for for puritanical thinking i think it's incredibly incredibly harsh and incredibly unkind to the beautiful multifariousness Mm -hmm. of human spirit. Yeah. And I'm curious how, I mean, there's so many sorts of conversations that are going on that are changing society and hopefully will change these sort of systemic issues that we've had, such as for how however many centuries just the embracing of like these patriarchal values right like i wonder if mm-hmm. once those systems are broken down and more women are in power how things will change on a mass scale if there will be more balance to the to this life and mm. how there will be these societal shifts but also i mean i mean speaking to that, but also kind of like what you were saying before, I mean, something that came to mind was, you know, going back kind of like to the NFT stuff, but, um, I was listening to a podcast where you were talking about Apollo and Cassandra. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking about that story and, you know, maybe for the listeners, like you can talk about that or I can talk about that, but, uh, just essentially, you know, she was given the gift of prophecy, right? And mm-hmm. speaking about patriarchal values, it's like Apollo bestowed this gift upon her, right, for a kiss, right, right. right. <laughs> and then it's just like, what, like, what the fuck? But right, she didn't ask for it; it was not consensual. <laughs> and exactly. then he gets mad when she won't give it to him. Exactly, so, yeah, he, he curses her to never be believed. So, surprise, this gift is actually a curse. Exactly. And then, and then, so like, I was just thinking about that in terms of maybe your life before NFTs, how this feeling of having the gift of prophecy, but no, no one really hearing you, or maybe if you, or like when you initially got into NFTs and you have that small NFT community, but everyone you tell about this NFT community, they're like, what the fuck you sell digital (laughs) art online and then people buy it. Mm -hmm. and but they don't own the physical product yeah right i mean is that is that kind of in line with those trains of thought or i was just curious why you uh were drawn to the story of cassandra yeah well yes i mean absolutely there's there's that the the grander aspect of just what it is to be early to something and it's also like horton hears a who Uh, You know, this idea of like (laughs) when you're the smarty pants who knows what's going on, everyone's like, why does she think she's so smart? We don't like her until, you know, until there's a a problem. And then everyone, everyone always will believe once it's too late. You know, it's the story of Horton Hears a Who. It's the story of Cassandra. Nobody believes you until it's too late. And um, it's the story of Dr. Anthony Fauci as well. Um, yeah, and the story of global warming. Yeah, right. It's the story of humanity, basically. It's it's like always there. We always have 
we always have prophets warning us early and we don't listen to them because we always decide that our prophets are duty heads that are stupid and we shouldn't listen to them. And then mm-hmm. and then it's always like, oh, Dr. Hoovy, we should have listened. We'll be good. I, I recently rewatched Horton. Here's a who that's I'm bringing it up. And I was like, oh, this is such a wish fulfillment fantasy that they have a whole song about how they're like, we realize now that you're right and we're going to do whatever we have to do to like make things good again and i was like oh bless the optimism of dr seuss like thank god we all bathed in that as children because Mm -hmm. if you let go of it if you let go of the optimism i i don't know how i don't know how you can keep going in this very complex world um if you don't if you don't have that hope right but of course hope is is the last uh the last ill that was let out of pandora's box uh in that in that myth people always th- it's been that myth has been like christianized like to be about salvation to be about grace the idea of oh well all the ills were let out into the world but because we have you know christ love we're, we'll be okay that is not what that myth was originally about uh originally <laughs> hope was the last of the evil things let out of the box because hope is what makes humans endure the suffering that that hope is actually the most evil of the evils because it keeps you going when there when there really is no uh when there really is no hope um so that's fun that's but <laughs> that's another no, 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 that's fascinating i mean um, because like even when you're talking about uh dealing with your angels right angels mm. in a societal context or even a religious monotheistic context are seen as being the good right sure but sure. Just spinning it for just the sake of the argument, I guess, or mm-hmm. the sake of the conversation. But, you know, sometimes, you know, there's this always this or lately there's been this talk of toxic positivity. Right? Ah, mm-hmm. And so if you just mask your entire life with just positivity, I'm only going to think positive thoughts and, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not going to deal with negative things, negative aspects. I mean, you will eventually feel that in your body. Eventually those things come up. Yeah, the demiurge will rise within you. Yeah. <laughs> I think of that shit demon that's in uh, what's that? Kevin, <laughs> Kevin Smith's Dogma. Yeah, God, I love <laughs> Kevin Smith demon. movies as a kid. Like that's what I picture: oh, yeah. <laughs> the shit demon so that'll like good. come out of you if you. I used to love that movie when I was repress, like repress. If you repress that, you know, I love it, it coalesces into a full blown shit monster. Yeah, um, that will like bite you and cover you in shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> metaphorically speaking probably i love the um what was it the, the like the happy jesus or uh-huh what, uh-huh or like oh, yeah, buddy christ else. i think it was buddy christ. buddy christ god i haven't watched that movie in a long time me too um, it's been a while i also like that movie and saved when oh I was yeah kid. saved was great um yeah. it's that where i grew up was uh it's very it was very evangelical and where, where did you grow up i grew up in ohio Mm. And, um, yeah, being one of the only Jewish kids in town in a lot of ways, again, it's like so many things, so many of these early (laughs) traumas or early like challenges of ours are actually gifts in the long run. And that's what I sort of meant earlier about like, as you get older, you have moments where you meet your strength and you meet your metal and realize I was galvanized in fire. Like I had to deal with people telling me I was going to hell, people saying horrible anti-Semitic things, horribly hateful things in the name mm-hmm. of God, which I think is about the most perverse thing a person can do. Um, and for me, it's actually been very much a journey of of coming to recognize, well, that's you can't, that's not all Christians. Not all Christians are like that. And Christianity at its core, I think, is actually a very beautiful religion. Um, it's it's the way people pervert it that's the problem yeah. and the things they do in the name of it that's the problem and that's yeah. what I mean by I'm not a dogmatic person but I I have I've always been very fascinated by by all the world religions it's that really I'm I'm a I just I like myths and I like I like all these ways we make yeah. sense of the world for ourselves I like old stories um, but it's all essentially to say, yeah oh, oh yeah sorry, sorry sorry go ahead oh no I was gonna say and. A lot of these, I mean, I'm going to say it like in mo- the most general sense, but a lot of these religions are essentially pointing to the same things. Oh, a hundred percent, and that's why I really like uh, like theosophy. You know, uh, mm. if you're familiar mm. at all, um, and for those who aren't, bit, the- yeah. it was theosophy was this like organization that was basically the origin of comparative religion, and that was that. Oh. It was this nineteen. 19- did that? Did that? Did that come out of the? Um, 
uh, transcendental movement? Like the- It, it theosophy? didn't directly. They weren't directly related. Um, theosophy, I believe, started in England, I want to say, by by uh, Helena H.P. Blavatsky, who's Russian, um, among, you know, among others, but she's sort of their their figurehead. And I think then it moved to New York. So I don't think it was directly uh, stemmed from American transcendentalism, but all those movements of the 19th century stemmed from this fascination with the electric age and like the industrial era that it was Mm. like all these religion or I'm sorry, not religions, but like spiritual movements and, and spiritual intellectual movements it was like a way of them making new new myths and new mysticism around the electrified era, you know, the 19th mm-hmm. century, the advent of electricity. And so theosophy is also what brought Eastern religion to the United States. Theosophy is the origin of what we would call New Age in the United States. Uh, they, you know, they brought Hinduism and Buddhism Um are they perfect? Absolutely not. None of these 19th century. Look, I, when you bring them up, I think it has to be it has to be said that like they had some problematic thoughts, like like <laughs> a lot of these organizations. Think, thankfully, I might be mistaken, but I think I well, was run sure, by a bunch of men. Well, but theosophy was was uh, uniquely largely uh, had just as many women as men. And again, like I said, their leader was a woman. So that's part of why I think theosophy is is still worth looking at and understanding. And I believe Hmm. I believe they had a split at some point because eugenics got kind of popular among some of these Mm. among some of these organizations. And I believe theosophy split from the people in their ranks who believed in eugenics. Uh, it's all to say <laughs> the 19th century was a wild time for thinking. That's all. But yeah, but I highly recommend people check out theosophy because I bring it up because of what you're saying that they mm-hmm. sort of, I think were like the first, the first well-known group to make this point that the myths we have in all these different world religions are, are too similar to not be interconnected uh, you know, and they were before Joseph Campbell, who sort of like expounded on that idea and came up yeah, with the totally. idea of the monomyth. Um, so theosophy and and H.P. H. P. Blavatsky really introduced the West to notions of, do you realize there are there's the flood myth, there's the Christ myth, there's the, you know, every myth we have exists also in the East, in Eastern religions. It exists also in Greek mythology. All these things that we understand to be Judeo-Christian are not uniquely Judeo-Christian. Uh, we just have translated them. You know, myth ends up getting the texture of whatever culture it, it's filtering through. But the bones of these stories exist in all all these spaces. And, you know, they kind of got fanciful with it and proposed the idea of like Atlantis. They're the ones who came up with the idea of Atlantis, you know, mm. in a lost civilization that's older, um, which obviously scientifically we know is like, yeah, it's not, that's not, that didn't happen. That's not really a thing exactly the way they said it did. But it does, I guess why I, why I chew on it so much and why I like thinking about it and why I would say theosophy has had a, a large, a big effect on my art as an artist, you know, is what I think is still very valid about what they brought up is really a question more than an answer. And it's that question of, well, why, why are myths from, from groups of people that we didn't think had contact with each other back then? Why are there myths that are similar to the point that it can't be a coincidence, similar to the point of, wait, there, there's something, there's something older that happened there's something that we that's lost to us that we don't understand of why is culture the way it is. We don't fully yet grasp the story of how it evolved to be this. And that's one of those big questions in life that I think keeps you like a child and, and keeps you inquisitive and keeps you going, well, that's kind of exciting. That's kind of exciting that it makes you feel like there's something special and and magical about this story of humanity and and it makes you feel good. It's again one of those things that fills you with the sense of like maybe maybe we are all more connected than than we ever really 
give ourselves credit for or realize. Mm. We're also obsessed with drawing boundaries and lines and saying, we're here and you're there and we're like this and you're like that. And theosophy kind of brings this idea and it brings it at a time when you realize that it's from the mid 19th century and you're like, how have we still not fully gotten hip to this idea that there is no us and them, that there is homo sapiens and then there is not homo sapiens. Like we are all one species on this big blue rock, you know, Mm. and and I think that recognizing that and embracing that is going to be the defining question of our century that that borders and boundaries are not the way to survive in this incredibly exponentially changing future that like do away with the borders and the boundaries like we need to become we need to become a unified organism or or we're probably not gonna, not going to make it you know like yeah um, I, w- I, w- I wonder i mean I mean, it's good that there's conversations like this that are going on on a, on a more mass scale as well. But I wonder if human beings will ever be able to fully embrace the symbiosis that life is Mm -hmm. before this is like total dystopia, (laughs) this is dystopian like argument before total mass destruction. No, I, I look, and that's what I mean by it's about one of the biggest questions we have. It's the question of survival. My my wife and I used to have a project uh, that I don't know we might revive at some point that we called transcend or die, and it's it's a question, not a command. <laughs> We're not commanding anyone to die. It's the yeah. point is this is this is the defining question of of the next hundred years. Are you going to transcend or are you going to die? And what we see and why I, I I know what you're saying, why it does, it can bring up that, again, sense of nagging dread within you because you're like, oh, oh, I think I know the answer and I don't like it. I don't want it to be the answer. And it's because right now we have 50 percent of the people in the world who are ready to move forward, who are ready for this next thing, who are like already in it, you know, already developing this web of how we live as a as humanity 2.0. And then you have 50 percent of the world who says, I would rather die. I, I have convictions. I have whatever it is, beliefs, dogma, uh, you know, rigid tribal notions that I would rather die than than change than move forward. And I and I and so I will take you down with me. <laughs> and, and that's it's terrifying because you realize how much we really do all rely on each other for progress. Hmm. Do you, I mean, just from your perspective, because you've been in the crypto and NFT world mm-hmm. for, for a while, but do you see, I mean, you know, cause we're talking about more humanitarian causes, but do mm-hmm. you see greater humanitarian causes being able to be translated within that space? Or maybe let me rephrase that a little bit, but like, how do you see NFT contributing to the, mm-hmm. to humanity on a greater scale? That's a great question. And um, I do my best to not proselytize uh, about NFTs, right? Because look, NFTs, I could just, we could just say canvases, you know, NFT is just a container technology. You know, it'd be weird to refer to paintings as canvases, right? And so, yeah. And so, there's a degree to which I sort of go, well, NFTs are just this way, this new way for digital artists to, you know, edition their work. But I do recognize there is a, of course, a greater cultural moment happening here that is below the surface, below, you know, below all the hype and all these stories about crazy amounts of money being made by certain people doing certain things. Below all that, what we're seeing is is a group of people, a cohort of people, you know, of which I myself am obviously included, who are, how do I want to put this, who are actively divorcing value from the physical realm. Like that Mm. we're actively saying what we do as spirit beings, you know, maybe that's a mystical way to put it, but 
I like mystical yeah. ways of putting things. Yeah, it's like, the, and what I mean by that again, if because if anyone's rolling their eyes, going, "Oh Jesus Christ!" What, like, it's okay. Let them roll their eyes. Yeah, I, what I mean by that is, you know, I often think I've been thinking about this a lot lately, especially because I, I am an artist who happens to be female. Uh, I do not define as a female artist. My, my femaleness has nothing to do with my art exactly. Yeah, and especially as someone who creates work that is digital that is incorporeal i shall say i think that's a better way to put it because it's my work is also analog so it's it's a it's its own beast it's incorporeal it's not physical it's not object based it's to say that i am acutely aware of how being a human being means being a synthesis of flesh and spirit and the two things have always been taken to be, by necessity, intertwined. That you, without your flesh vehicle, <laughs> cannot move in this world, cannot do anything in this world, are not an object-based entity. Well, what we're doing here, and you might laugh, things like this often happen in funny ways at the beginning. It's funny that the way we're doing this is through like dog memes and, and like, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> of course, there's a lot about NFTs that is just shit posting and funny. But like I like I said, underneath all that, if you look at it, if you take the wider lens and look at it culturally, look at what we're doing, what we're doing for the first time ever, because we've never had the technology to do this before is we are saying human beings can exist disembodied from their flesh vehicle and have a society that is not predicated on what our bodies are doing or where they are or what they what they mean and hmm. why i brought up the female the female artist thing because it's it's obviously a, it's a it's important to me right of it's what you were saying earlier about patriarchal models and yeah and and like you know well if we have more women in power and i will never deny that represent representation is hugely important for anyone of any identity that if you don't see people of your of your particular experience or background in important places that has a psychological effect on you so i'm not trying to say i'm not uh, what i'm not speaking to here is questions of representation on a greater level and i guess again my position in all of this has afforded me this viewpoint is that i look forward to the future where the peculiarities of our flesh vehicle are not so important because hmm. i conduct myself primarily in the metaverse, let's say, or, you know, the internet is probably a better way to put it. Sure. But the metaverse, the nascent metaverse. And of course, having to ex having experienced life as a human woman, yes, I have particular life experiences because of that. And absolutely that filters into my art in way, you know, our who we are and what we've experienced. Of course, that our art is not, we're not able to separate our art and our expression from that. But by the same token, it frustrates me to be put in this position of being othered based on what my body is hmm. when my body is not what people are interacting with. They're interacting with my spirit. They're interacting with these sort of like my, you know, the, the Sarah that is also Jethro that is also <laughs> and that's a whole other thing that I often in, in being sort of labeled as female artist i i yeah. it upsets me that people don't and this is sort of my my personal thing that my my gender identity and myself people often don't i pass right i pass as female i pass as certain things and there's a there's a blessing and a curse to passing and the curse is that you can never truly be known like i am not only female i am also male and some people get that about me. Uh, and if I had chosen to be anonymous, if I had chosen to not use my given name, which is a name associated with with being female, I don't think people would know the gender of my flesh suit. Like, mm. I don't think I present as overtly 
one gender or the other. At, you know, sometimes I pre- present as one and sometimes I present as another. And that's just my personal, I don't even want to say way of identifying because it's not at how I identify. It's just what I am and who I am and have always been. I have yeah. always been this way. And and I think I think that you, I mean, you know, outside of the whole NFT metaverse sort of like conversational space, just being able to embrace who you are there's such a power in that because that mm. energy that you have within yourself emanates out. And I mean, that also brings back to, you know, bring us, brings us back to that conversation about just the viewpoint of the artist in general and identifying, right. And just thinking mm-hmm. about this idea of performance, right. Mm-hmm. This, the idea of performing of what you think an artist should be or what you yeah. think you should be as opposed to being, Right. So I, I think about Absolutely. that and, and, yeah. and just, and, and just kind of like also just like discrimination based off of what your flesh suit, flesh <laughs> suit looks like. Right. Right. Um, as opposed to, you know, I guess that's what you're saying as well is that if anything, you know, outside of just the, like the technological aspects of the metaverse, this space presents a psychological benefit of being able to exist outside of what you look like. Oh, absolutely. And and I guess that's why then, and again, as I said earlier, I reserve the right to contradict myself. Nothing I ever say is some is a is a hill I'm willing to die on because I <laughs> like I said, I'm a Cheshire cat. I always recognize that the opposite yeah. is is also always true. It's kind of like but taking mushrooms, you know, when the walls uh, melt. Yeah. And then, uh-huh. but, but then, but then they reform, and then you look yeah. back, and then they melt again. And you're like, oh, I see. Everything is both. <laughs> Everything yeah. is is both a zero and a one mm. at different times and at the same time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I've done some psychedelics. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, I've never done say, them. Just oh, you know, really? for the record. No, I'm wow. just kidding. No, no, no. I have. Yeah. I, have. I was, I was yeah. like, really? I'm yeah. amazed that you like, you know, you just channeled that. I guess from from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just yeah. like the collective consciousness. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah, I guess my point to that is, and again, it's speaking to what I was saying of I recognize representation is important, but it's it's just something I've been chewing on a lot lately because I don't lead ever with my with my identity. Uh, and it's not in no way is it because I'm ashamed of my identity. It's because my identity is fractal and I'm different. I'm different. To different people and I'm not and, and I think a lot I, I think a lot of people are that way but they feel the peer pressure of choosing a box they feel the peer pressure mm. and I guess this goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning that just my own personal experience in life that I have learned to be comfortable being an alien uh, <laughs> as a child I actually told all my classmates that I was an alien because they'd always ask me why are you so weird why are you smart why are you like that why do you ask these questions you ask why are you weird weird girl and so I you know you don't have to be a child psychologist to figure out how I (laughs) what I did I said oh I'm an alien I'm from the planet Zardoff I keep my spaceship in my parents basement and I'm I'm here for a bit and you know maybe we can hang out if you're down but like yeah I'm an alien that's why well it sounds like it sounds like too that I mean just from what I've been hearing from this whole conversation It sounds like that you have felt, you know, where you grew up in Ohio, you felt like a huge outsider, which, you know, brings us back to the idea of you saying that you were an alien to your classmates. (laughs) And then also, I think, might be an attraction to wanting to know more about baseball because baseball (laughs) generally, (laughs) you know, to bring it back to the beginning, right? Because baseball generally attracts the lowest common denominator, right? Uh, Right, right. Um, In a general sense, right? Yeah. And you know what's interesting is I'm just going to, I generally don't like to like put a bunch of personal anecdotes into these Uh conversations, but um, so personal interest of mine is is fighting. Okay. Uh, Since my early, I'm 35 now, Mm -hmm. I just turned 35. And uh, since my early 20s, I've been doing boxing and Brazilian jiu-jitsu and mm-hmm. different martial arts. And I realize in UFC, for instance, 
how that attracts the lowest common denominator of just toxic masculinity Mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I have certain conversations with my partner about that. And she looks at, you know, what's being put on the screen. I I see it as somewhat of an art form and Mm -hmm. kind of the fantastical, ridiculous nature of it all. I can kind of laugh at it, (laughs) but I also understand from her perspective, how that perpetuates this patriarchal narrative of mm. toxic masculinity, right? So I don't exactly know what I'm trying to get with at that point, but I think the idea of uh, feeling like an outsider, but also being attracted to things that are more of like this mainstream thing. And really at the end of the day, for better or for worse, it could just be a way for us to be able to communicate with a larger group of people, right? Right, L- which is which is currency, which is valuable. You know, you saying that, I'm sitting here nodding because that's exactly my experience moving in the crypto space, moving, you know, in NFTs is every day I see things where I think, oh, that is such a chauvinistic pig-headed thing to say. You know, <laughs> I, I won't I won't deny that there yeah. is some incredibly toxic masculinity. Uh, it's a it's a space and, dominated by men. And I love I love to challenge that too because yes, I mean, you know, I'm still understanding and observing. I mean, just 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 the world in general, right? Just understanding my place in the world and and understanding the sort of. Um, identity politics right because i do talk Mm -hmm. a lot about the fighting stuff and Mm -hmm. you know and being an athlete and you know i still am an athlete you know and just but the idea of essentially incepting with these trojan horse ideas and i'm still trying to think of how to eloquently relate certain things about these systemic patriarchal values Mm -hmm. that are very toxic to the fabric of our of humanity right and seeing how what place i have within that you know what i mean because like i can also talk a lot about fighting because i've been doing it for so long well right it's look i I think right you're you're experiencing like i said the same thing i experienced with crypto uh or nfts where you recognize the thing itself, the skill of fighting. It's an art, like you said, it's an art form. There's, yeah, it's, it's like dancing. It's like ballet, exactly, but you just hit someone. That you are drawn <laughs> to that, but yeah, you would. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you would deny that maybe there's a problem in the culture. And that's the same way I feel. Uh, you know, sometimes with crypto, as I go, I believe in this thing. This aligns with my values. There's something we're building here that is incredibly potent and incredibly culturally important. And I want to be a part of it. I I not only want to be a part of it, I feel called to be Mm. a part of it. I feel like it's something I've been preparing for my entire life in a certain way. But I also, you know, it's it's that you catch more flies with honey situation of Hmm. I recognize that you will be far more effective changing something from the inside than you Hmm. are when you're on the outside yelling at it. When you're yeah. seen as shaking your fist and yelling, it's so easy for the people part of something to go, look at those people. Aren't they stupid? We think they're dumb. We laugh at them. But if you're an insider, if you've managed to gain uh, respectability within that culture, that's when you – this is what I mean by – and it's why I'm I'm very careful in how I conduct myself and they're – you know uh, – it's a question I'm asking myself always of the risk, the risk of taking this route, the risk of trying to change something from the inside comes back to exactly what we were talking about. It comes to comfort. The risk of changing it from the inside is as you get comfortable, it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget that that you have something you're passionate about and change you want in the world, especially as you get older. Like I said, it's easy to stop wrestling with angels. It's, it's the easiest thing in the world to give up the fight. And it's something that I continue always to ask myself to go as part of being part of this, as part of being embraced by people. I perhaps if they, how do I want to put this? By by part of being embraced by people who maybe hold values that are not aligned with mine is that you have to know that you remain staunch and that you remain steadfast in your convictions and know that bit by bit, 
And over time, I mean, this is what I've seen in my own life, like as a queer person yeah, and people I've known, you know, uh, a long time in my life. And I didn't just wake up as a queer person one day, even though, you know, I didn't really come out to people in my life until I was in my late 20s. I wasn't really aware of it myself until I was in my late 20s. It was a process of discovery. Uh, and again, yeah. that that late bloomer aspect is I probably true of a lot of people who are in-betweeners like me, right? Like everything I'm, I am, I'm only half that thing. Uh, so it mm. makes it, it's that thing where then you're never, you are that thing. So some people reject you for being that thing, but then you're not enough of that thing. So the people who are that thing reject you for not being enough of that thing. Um, but I guess my point in all of that is I have seen over the past decade, I've seen over time how just by knowing a queer person, People who I maybe grew up with or people like the family friends or whatever who once upon a time would have been homophobic, would have said, would have not even thought twice about saying homophobic things. Just the sheer factor of them being like this person I know, Sarah, who I've known since she was a little girl and who is a very sweet person. Uh, well, she's a good person and I and she isn't all these horrible things I've told myself gay people are. Or queer people are, yeah. and and that effect over time it softens that view of them, and it softens it to the point where they may meet a moment where they encounter homophobia, and will be shocked that they end up being the defender of queer people. The same person who would have been homophobic ten, fifteen, twenty years ago now will in a be in a position where they're actually defending queer people because they know a queer person now. And they know that queer people aren't just weird people yeah. out there doing stuff they don't like. They know an actual living, breathing human who they like. And then they go, hey, you know, and and I guess that's my point is like there is potency. There is power in just being existing. In, in existing and being just a loving, open, honest person among people who are who maybe don't realize how hateful they're being and if you yeah. can be among them and show them in a way where you're not preaching to them again this is what i mean i think people don't realize when you when you lambast people or criticize them they just immediately close their hearts they immediately go i'm under attack i don't want to hear it they put on their armor and i guess that's what i'm trying to get at with all of this and it's what i aim to do in my life my god i'm not a perfect person i don't know that i always succeed but i aim just it's all about the long term for me everything i'm doing i've always recognized that it's like you can't be so fixated on short-term gains you have to recognize that your life is a cumulative project it's everything is holistic and even disappointments you experience in any given moment can end up being some of your biggest successes given the additive of time. And so even in this, even in what we're talking about of shifting cultures that are toxic or have toxicity within them, I think the most important thing you can do is recognize, well, pe there aren't evil people, typically. There are sociopaths, definitely. Good to know. Good to notice when someone's a sociopath. <laughs> have definitely yeah. gotten into trouble uh, with sociopaths and have gone, oh, shit, you don't work the same way as everyone else. And mm -hmm. I should actually probably stay away from you because you're um, – I, I don't know how to operate when people don't have empathy. Um, but, but the average human being is built to have empathy and is built to um, – experience love so it's that of it's finding a way of engaging with them in a way where they don't immediately put their wall up where they don't immediately put their armor on and shut you out uh and and the only way to do that is 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 like mm -hmm. inoculation right it's like i am i am the sarah zucker vaccine like you get, like to just sort of slowly get their system acquainted yeah. with what you are and what what you are of yeah and and in time they won't even realize it and their heart will have changed totally and and to your point i mean with that, all that being said i think that it behooves us to lean in more into ourselves so mm -hmm. that we can lead mm -hmm. by example lack of a better term right but or to use the typical term rather <laughs> <laughs> but i mean it's 
it's true and and we owe it to ourselves to really lean into to whatever makes us uniquely us and maybe in our past 100%. yeah and, may, and maybe in our past we might have been the outsider and the people around us are telling us you know when we were we were kids that oh you know you shouldn't do that and or you know it's kind of like um when i was listening to a podcast that you were on you were talking about this i believe it was an art class you were taking mm. and it was in the mid 90s and a teacher told you that you shouldn't use photoshop mm -hmm. because something uh, i think you triggered something within her yes of um what's it called that went against her technical understanding of like how art is made yes <laughs> right? yes and well, um, and i think it made her feel obsolete inferior. and that's oh, yeah. i that's what i think a lot of us who are working with nfts are coming up against right now uh you know when you come up against this like totally unearned hatred of nfts i mean some people it is like they hate nfts like nfts are hitler or something and when I come up against it, especially <laughs> yeah. if it's another artist, if it's another creative person, um, the thing that I that really strikes me is this isn't hate. This is fear that yeah. they're they're mad because they're fearful. They're mad because they're feeling left out and they're feeling left behind that this is really triggering for them. In a moment where everyone is so vulnerable and everyone is so tender after this pandemic, like we're all a little weird. We're all a little like this did a number on everyone psychologically. Yeah. So it's that remembering that that like everyone's a little bit of like a dog that was kept in a cage for too long right now and like had to pee on itself. Like we're, be be gentle with people. Um it's it's recognizing that the that this fear is coming from this sense of I don't understand it. And yet I'm seeing it everywhere, which means I can't deny that it's like a thing now and it's making me feel old and it's making me feel out of touch and I hate it and I hate anyone who has anything to do with it. That That is like the vibe I, I get from it. I, I think that, see, it's not, the negative thing I don't think is having those fears. Mm -hmm. The negative thing is not being able to embrace the fear. <laughs> Right. Well, and taking it out on other people. Yeah, and because, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah. I said earlier, fear can be one of your greatest assets. Fear exists in us. It's an evolutionary trait that protects us. Oh, you know, yeah. as a as a highly sensitive person, having a heightened sense of fear, I mean, we evolved to be this way to make sure we didn't get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, you know, that fear saves your ass in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So it's that, exactly. Fear, I think, too often gets a bad rap. Again, you were talking about toxic positivity that I, I often hear people talk about fear like it's the Baba Duke. <laughs> like, I mean, I think that's what the Baba Duke is about, actually, as a movie. Yeah. It's about that fear of fear, the fear of, oh, but if I'm afraid, I'm weak. Well, no, you're yeah. weak if you don't recognize that you have fear and if you don't learn how to dance with it. Mm. And that's what I think artists do so well. I think that's our calling is we we dance with our fear at the edge of the abyss, you know, we're out there dancing with it, wrestling with it, knowing it and asking it questions instead of like hiding from it and going, no, no, no. Maybe if it doesn't see me, it won't get me. And it's like, no, it's it's yours. It's you. <laughs> your fear yeah. is you. And you're absolutely right. The fear is not the problem. The fear. That's what I mean. The fear is the most even what I just said about that, that's how those people feel. Well, I know how it feels to feel like that. Every human alive knows how it feels to be like, oh, shit, there's this new way things are being done and I've never heard of it and I'm late to the party. That doesn't make me feel good. Yeah. The problem is that then they feel that way and then they allow it to propel them to attack someone on the Internet, to scream things, you know, to say mean things to them, to, to a person they don't know anything about. And while that's relatively minute, you know, someone saying mean things to you on the internet, it's not that big of a deal on its own. But if you multiply that by many, many, many people, well, that's how some of the worst things in, in the history of civilization have happened. If just a mass of angry people, instead of dancing with their own fear and asking themselves why they're afraid, going, well, those people are why. Those people are why I'm afraid. Let's get them. 
those are the bad people. Let's get them. Like how many things have happened in history because that's how people handled their fear. And mm. and it's like the oldest story in the book and it can be very frustrating yeah. when you see it continue to happen. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think, you know, there's a really good lesson there to be able to confront the thing that you're afraid of, you know, even if it takes a really long time. But, you know, I was recently watching, I don't know if you've seen the show on Hulu, but it's called Dope Sick. Have you seen it? No. It's, oh my God, it's so good. Um, I'm going to be interviewing uh, one of the directors. Her name's Patricia Regan. Mm -hmm. And she's actually one, basically the only Latina director that is a like a widely working director. Wow. <laughs> Um, but the reason why I bring up the show is there's a, a part in that show where they're talking about, so the, the, the entire show is about Oxycontin mm. and how it became prevalent in the United States, um, what family was behind it. So it was a private family that operated this pharmaceutical company um, called Purdue Pharma. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And basically the president of the company in one of the episodes wanted to introduce it to Germany to essentially incept that, you know, the entirety of Europe because Germany mm -hmm. has the, um, the strictest restrictions. Um, but anyways, the, one of his constituents was saying that part of the culture in Germany is that they know that pain is part of healing Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, and I was like, oh, and they, wow. hey, that that's uh, they know, right? I mean, as a country, they know. Yeah, they know yeah. about pain. Totally, and um, right, yeah. you can't just. I. It's funny you saying this that you said about how how these these tangents can become cyclical because I feel like we're returning to what we were talking about at the very beginning <laughs> and that idea yeah. of like don't glaze over your pain don't it's a it's one of the greatest gifts you can be given like pain makes you grow yeah. and um I, and i think that's so potent for artists and just all all people and i think that again that's right that's why we have such trouble with with uh specifically narcotics you know yeah. as, a, as a species is that we're so afraid of pain because uh, yeah. it's awful pain is awful um, and, and we'd rather many of us, you know, it's, it's a very, or I'd say all of us, all of us know the sweet allure of, of just making it stop, just numbing it, numbing mm. the pain. Yeah. And, and I think it's that of, I don't know. I don't know what, what there is to take from that other than if you, it, it, as Marcel Proust would say, if you must suffer, at least suffer productively, mm. and you must suffer. It is, it is the, the unfortunate, um, one of the unfortunate conditions of being alive. You yeah. must suffer. You will suffer. So, if you must, at least get something out yeah. of it. Do it productively. Yeah, and also to pull one out of Viktor Frankl's book. I mean, mm. you know, finding meaning out of that suffering, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I think, um, I mean, I'll just. Um, I know I I know that we're uh, we're approaching like uh, almost two hours now. <laughs> yes, but we've been waxing quite poetic. <laughs> yeah, no, it's great. It's great. Uh, I I like I said about the personal anecdotes, but I, I just want to bring this up just because I think it's kind of relevant. But um, when I first started boxing, I, I think you know as as a man, you know, growing up in the society where um, you're kind of encouraged to like gloss over your feelings about certain things. Mm -hmm. I wasn't heavily mm -hmm. encouraged necessarily when I was a kid, but it's more of like a um, environmental societal sure. thing, right? And so when I first started boxing, I was deathly afraid of getting punched in the face. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that's understandable. <laughs> yeah, I was so yeah. scared. I was so scared. Great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's not it's not great, right? But the thing is, is that I think this is kind of relevant to just the the sor sort of pain argument and assuming that, you know, I got out of it to where my brain is still intact, right? But the lesson I think there is that, you know, for the first year, sparring was like torture as hell, 
right? Mm. But then mm-hmm. you start getting better and better and then you start getting more comfortable and you know how to react and all of these things, right? And then you start to, or I started to like it, right? And, yeah. And there's a lot of growth when you don't just detract from it and you completely take mm. yourself out of it, right? There's a lot of growth that can happen within a person, right? And I think that's the positive thing outside of the um, toxic environment that is boxing. Yeah, that's beautiful. I've had a very analogous experience with yoga, which might sound funny to people because no, I mean, it's, yoga, pain, it, it's, it's so painful gentle. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I am. I just was not blessed with a particularly flexible body. Uh, mm. And yet I've been very dedicated to my yoga practice for about five and a half years now. And that's great. The first uh, God, I'd say easily the first six months, if not the first year, I like shook with terror during my yoga class because <laughs> oh, yeah. the teacher would ask, you know, that I, I really loved the, t- you know, I practiced Iyengar yoga and I really loved that even though I was in like a beginner friendly class, it's not, like I said, it wasn't dub- dumbed down. I love that when things ask you to come up to their level instead of coming down to your level, it's, mm. it makes you better. But I remember at least the first couple weeks of class, I... I literally shook with terror and cried and not not cry like boo hoo 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 like my nervous system I had to cry like I had to it 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 oh it activated such a f- deep fear in me such a mm. fear of am I going to hurt myself am I going to I don't want to go upside down I don't trust I don't trust my body is what it brought up for me was and then so much trauma that came out of me from years of gym class, years of people making fun of my body, people, you know, mm. that I think for any human alive. But again, certainly if you've had to go through this life with a female body, you endure uh, the average human woman, I think, endures a lot of trauma around her body just yeah. because of the culture we live in. Uh, every woman alive probably can relate to that of this sense of like my poor body has just had to take so many arrows psychic and physical and yeah the first i mean for a good long while it just i trembled with fear i cried i i gasped it was i thought oh my god this teacher's going to think i'm a lunatic you know and that thing where you wanted to say to someone like i apologize i'm just a very sensitive person <laughs> like i'm so sorry i cry through every class but i'm terrified right now i'm terrified that my body won't hold me and won't do what i need it to do and and just like you were saying with the fighting is i was so fascinated when the shift happened Again, it's like talking about an inoculation. It's being inoculated with that fear, (laughs) having that fear and not shying away from it, not quitting, not quitting the class that I kept going. And in time, exactly, I I not only developed a dialogue with my body and a trust with my body that wasn't there at the beginning, I learned to dialogue with that fear differently because it's still come i mean years later it still comes up if if we i'm in a more advanced class now and if if something comes up that's like oh boy i don't know about that i have to like i i know now how to sit with it and go now is there a part of this fear i actually genuinely need to listen to because my my body does have particularities that i don't i can't i have to be careful that i don't injure my neck or my shoulder or yeah. you know certain things i do have issues with and then or and then dialogue with it and go or is this just some old thing telling me you don't trust yourself when i can trust myself and it's kind of like pleasurable in a way now it's pleasurable yeah. to be confident in having that dialogue and and i i think you know bringing this back to our the analogous sort of story with this is that I think a lot of people want that reward, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't wait long enough to the point where they see that lesson, right? To where they get, they gain that perspective of, oh, wait, this is, this is actually what I'm meant for. Or, oh, wait, Mm -hmm. you know, like there's that specific individual lesson that you can come across. And that, that could be anything, right? It could be sport related. It could be, um, with with the arts Mm -hmm. but i think people and who knows what it is it's individual right people quit too soon yeah it's a it's a specifically insidious aspect i think of 
American culture, certainly, if not all Western culture, yeah. is the the expectation of of immediate reward. And it's, you know, we we covered that. We talked about that, how I think I think especially like in in scenarios where sometimes you do get immediate reward. And that can actually be a curse because anyone who's had like I was saying about child stars, like anyone who's had early success knows that that's then a burden to be like, well, how do I how do I top myself? How do I how do I replicate that or do better? You know, it's like and it's why I always point out to people, do not envy people who have success immediately because that is its own battle they have to fight that um and they and they often don't have the structure within their own life and within their own psyche to support ongoing holistic growth. Yeah. A- and then they're and then they're toppled by by the impact of this early success. Mm-hmm. And and it's that. It's like where the sweet stuff really happens in life is the stuff you build step by step, bit by bit, cumulatively with that magical, most magical of all ingredients, time. And like you said, it's true of every every human pursuit. It really is. Yeah. Um, and, and and yeah, I guess I it's that I I feel supremely grateful for for that like for feeling that deep within my bones and maybe yeah. having felt that for a long time uh, because I'm like anyone I get frustrated when I'm doing something and I'm seeing no reward. <laughs> um, that's a very I mean my God we're just silly little beans aren't we like we just really are like yeah. I want, I want my cookie. Where's my cookie? Um, you know what I mean. They have cookies. Where are my cookies? Um, you I know, like cookies. Yeah, exactly. Like I'm very, like I'm very much of my like... inner six year old. Yeah, <laughs> who's just like why don't I have cookies? Um, I mean, you know, like our ego, <laughs> like people's egos are so fragile, right? Like yeah. I, I think you know, we need to remember things like if you read a a book that you've come to some sort of realization, you're like, ah, I have it. And Uh then, you know, like six months later, you're like, I lost it. I lost it. I'm questioning everything. I thought it was the answer. Turns out there's no answer. (laughs) Yeah. We need to be reminded sometimes and that's okay. And sometimes we need little rewards along the way, but just don't get, um, I don't know. Just, don't just focus on the, that reward, I guess. Right? right. We do need little rewards along the way. I think yeah. it's that. I, I forget to point that out when I when I get on my get on my high horse, get up on my soapbox about long term, stick it out long term. And it's that thing I've been I was saying of, that I'm chewing on this idea of wrestling angels. Is it's it is it's that if you just like keep at it, and you're just never seeing anything from it and you're getting no feedback no positive reinforcement yeah it's i mean my god no no one can there are few people i should say who can keep going without any reward and i guess why i say that is that that reminder that we should all give ourselves i was thinking about this the other day because i have a friend who i just really look up to i just think she's like the bee's knees like she's just someone who everything she does i'm always like yes like she Mm. just is thoughtful in particular and i just i get it i love it and i was like saying that to my wife and my wife was like you know there are a lot of people who look at you and think that like there are a lot of people who you're that for them and you don't recognize it often enough and and i was like huh yeah life is really psychedelic like that in that we have this way of focusing so much on the people we look up to that we forget that other people look up to us and my point in that is that and that's true of I think literally every human alive wherever you are in the pecking order of whatever you do there are people who look up to you you know and 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 it's to say that you can bestow rewards upon others and I would be the first to tell you that giving gifts is often more pleasurable than receiving gifts. Yeah. Um, And that's, I guess my only point, and maybe that's, that's the takeaway I want people to take from this is, is to recognize if you feel like you're in that long dark night of the soul and you feel like you've been wrestling with your angel for years and years and years and nothing's coming of it, that the antidote to that is, is to be generous with others 
and to not heart to not harden yourself because I think that that is yeah. people think the thing to do is harden up, become more competitive, become more. And again, that's what you've been talking about with like that's the effect of patriarchy is that we go hardness is the best, hardness is strength, yeah. and it's like it is on the most base level. Yes, hardness is strength on the base level. But in the spirit realm, hardness means nothing. Hardness is of no importance. Mm. And in fact, hardness is heavy and it weighs you down. It weighs your spirit down. And to lighten yourself, to lighten your load, give things away. Give to others. Reward them. It's as simple as like just be generous with when you see something someone does and you think, yes, just give them a thumbs up. I mean, just <laughs> give them a heart eye, you know, whatever it is. Be generous with your comments. I'm talking, I, I mean, this is social media I'm talking about, but you can say them in real life. Just, and there's a fine line, right? You know, I, yeah. I'm not talking about being obsequious. I'm not talking about kissing people's ass because you want something out of them. That's a very different thing. And people know when that's what you're doing. I'm talking about apropos of nothing and with no motive just say something nice to someone else. You don't have to buy them a gift. You don't have to, you know, you don't have to like do something concrete. It is as simple as giving them this little token of energy of saying, I see you. I see you wrestling. I see you. I see you efforting. And I just am going to tell you, even though I cannot give you a job or I cannot give you, you know, this thing you're after, the big thing, what I can give you is just a token of saying, I see you and I like it. Keep going. Mm. That's beautiful. I think that's like a, a beautiful uh, punctuation for this conversation. <laughs> yeah. I love. Uh, no, Stick I love... it, print it, yeah. send it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> View it on our RSS feed. Yes. <laughs> Smash like and subscribe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love that. I love it when people say that. Oh, boy. Um, what a but, funny, what a funny time. Yeah, please in. rate us on iTunes. Oh my god, this is god. all going to age very well. I can tell you. Oh yeah. Oh oh yeah. For sure. Yeah. But by, by the time we we've been talking, um, the NFT space has already changed. So yeah. <laughs> no. But um. Anyways, no, I really appreciate you for taking this time and you know being so generous with with your time with me today and just um, yeah, I really appreciated just listening to your thoughts and. And sharing this dialogue. It's been great. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate your thoughtfulness and just openness to to where this conversation took us. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I feel like the older that I'm getting, the more that I just don't know anything at all. <laughs> Same. I'm just like, I Same. know nothing. Ah. I have more <laughs> questions and less answers. That's, that's for sure. <laughs> I think it's a better way to operate. Yeah. You know? It certainly makes yeah. you less annoying to people probably <laughs> probably maybe maybe probably. or maybe maybe more annoying yeah yeah everything is both <laughs> yeah well thanks i yeah thanks thanks for doing this and yeah. um yeah well, i look forward to uh talking again at, at some point Scully, thanks so much for tuning in. See you next time.